Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 18th annual Oregon Business Plan Leadership Summit, and this time it's virtual. And I am here with you live. It is 1 p.m. on a Monday in December in Oregon, and I'm proud to be with you here for the next 90 minutes as we put together a program for you that outlines our business plan and thoughts and, and what's kind of come out of an amazing year. My name's Joth Rickey. I'm the chair of your Oregon Business Plan, and I'm proud to represent a committee of, of amazing leaders from around our state uh, that have helped me inform, research, and think about how we look for the next three, six, nine, ten 10 years out for our state. And we're proud to bring you this program today. Before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors. Um, without that incredible group of sponsors that you saw before the show, we wouldn't be, would they have allowed us to bring this to you live, including the series that we started uh, back in basically early July. And finally, I want to thank my team from Dutch Bros from around the state of Oregon, the thousands of men and women um, who have been so resilient throughout of all of our communities this year and, uh, and work to make a great experience for our customers, but then also give back to our communities, especially to the devastated uh, communities of, of talent and Phoenix and Southern Oregon that have been hit by our wildfires. So a little setup for today. We've got uh, some interaction for you. We actually started working on the summit series uh, really back in July as we started to think about topics that we should cover um, based on the various things that, that happened over the course of this year. We also wanted to take the perspective of the future. We really did a lot of, of working with various leaders to understand where things were going. You're gonna hear from a lot of different people today. We're gonna to throw quite a bit of content at you today and it's gonna move pretty quickly. Uh, so without further ado, enough me. I want to uh, bring on a couple of guests who are not able to join us live today, but are bringing to you a, a special message about the business plan. Welcome to the 18th annual Oregon Business Plan. I was so honored years ago to be able to be one of the founders of the annual Leadership Summit. And so it's now again an honor in an unprecedented year to be able to say to friends, welcome to the 18th annual Leadership Summit. Although we can't be together as in years past, I applaud the Oregon Business Plan for moving forward virtually with their usual Oregon determination and creativity to make this special event happen. Last month, I very much appreciated business plan heroes like Mark Gans, Mike Alexander, and David Elwood, who talked to us about the critical issue of racial equity and social mobility. Those issues must, must continue to be front and center. And I know Mark Gans uh, particularly provides a wonderful example in the best spirit of the Oregon way of a business leader who's committed to community service. And I wanted to bring up Mark because I know that as he retires, all of us want to thank him as well as our Oregon Business Plan Chair, Josh Rieke, and so many others who make Oregon such an extraordinary place. This annual summit embodies an incredible public-private partnership. And each year you see it comes together to build an even stronger state. So let's get started. Greetings, I'm Senator Jeff Merkley, and welcome to the 2020 Oregon Business Plan Leadership Summit Series. This is a critical moment for our state and for our country. We are facing daunting challenges, unprecedented global health crisis, combined with an economic implosion impacting the lives of countless Americans. But with the right policy decisions and with all of us working together we have the opportunity to emerge from these difficult days with job growth and a strong economy. And that's why we're all together, at least virtually, for this event. I look forward to hearing Oregon Business Plan's recommendations today and meeting with you all early next year to discuss my federal policy priorities for the new Congress. Have a great meeting. I so much appreciate your contributions to the discussion on how we put America back on track. This is the 18th year of the Oregon Business Plan. Since 2002, it has brought together business and public leaders to propose policies that improve Oregon's economy and life. 
At the 2019 Leadership Summit last December, Oregon was writing a decade of economic growth. Looking ahead, we said that our work in 2020 would be mapping a way for Oregon to keep that prosperity going and to share it more widely among all of our communities. The World Health Organization confirming today that this is a global pandemic. Things will get worse than they are right now. Then last winter, the pandemic hit and it changed everything. Coronavirus cases in Multnomah County. We saw contagion, fatalities, lockdowns, business closures and disrupted daily life. And I am directing Oregonians tonight to stay home, to stay healthy. Within six months, we lost more than half a decade of economic growth. The crisis hit many Oregonians harder than others, especially people of color and low-income families. They suffered higher rates of infections and deaths, job losses, and financial insecurity. As schools shut down, children in poverty suffered learning loss double that of their peers. In this crisis, we shifted the business plan focus from sustaining prosperity to planning for a long-term recovery. The recovery we envisioned would restore our economy and reverse job losses. Just as importantly though, it would share prosperity more widely. This focus would be further intensified by subsequent events, by nationwide calls for racial justice, and by wildfires that devastated and threatened so many Oregon communities. Taking the process online, we started by launching a summit series of shorter virtual events from July through December to shape new Oregon business plan policy proposals for 2021 and beyond. We organized the series to reflect three main imperatives, growing jobs, fostering talent for those jobs, increasing economic opportunity and mobility. As part of the jobs objective, we partnered with industry clusters in showcasing their own growth strategies. We also supported leaders looking closely at threats to our forest and water resources. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Such events and conversations have produced some sobering yet encouraging takeaways. We can't go back to the way things were, in particular to inequities surfaced by the pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated trends that will make long-term recovery more challenging. Despite the challenges, there are also opportunities to create economic growth that's shared more equitably. Seizing opportunities will require policies and investments to encourage things like expanded broadband access, education innovation, reshored manufacturing, and affordable housing. To address festering inequities, Oregon will need to restructure institutions and make investments that help marginalized communities achieve greater resilience, opportunity, and economic mobility. Thank you for being a part of this effort, and thank you to our sponsors for underwriting this year's business plan and making it accessible at no cost. We hope you'll stay engaged with this work. For more, visit www.organbusinessplan.org. And what a difference from this time last year. Then, our challenge was to extend a decade of prosperity and share it more widely. Now it's an even taller order. We're still looking to build a decade of prosperity, but we also have to defeat a pandemic, restore a damaged economy, and tackle a legacy of historic racism and thwarted opportunity. And we have to do it mostly online. Still, what a better time to do this. Crisis makes the need for change more obvious, and it makes change more possible. In that regard, here's what we learned from prior series event from futurist Steve Brown and economist John Taponia. The second thing is this has been the great acceleration. What I mean by that is things that were going to happen anyway have happened much more quickly. I've had a number of clients come to me and say, Steve, I need your help. Here's my five-year business plan. These are the things I was going to do five years from now. I need to do them this year. Can you help me? So there's this appetite to speed up certainly digital transformation, 
uh, embracing digital technology to reach customers in new ways, uh, automation efforts, because quite candidly, uh, robots don't get sick and you know, robotic delivery vehicles don't carry disease, but generally to use innovation, to accelerate innovation efforts to dig our way out of economic uh, downturn. Um, and things that were going to happen anyway, companies that were failing slowly and painfully have gone out of business more quickly. Companies that were on the rise have you know, shot up like a rocket. Think Amazon versus JCPenney, for example. So the great acceleration is certainly well underway. The third lens I'd offer is this idea of the great defrosting. What I mean by this is that many organizations are frozen in place for a wide variety of reasons. It could be uh, reasons of tradition. So think about the educational sector. It could be uh, for reasons of regulation. So the healthcare sector is rightly regulated to try and save people's lives and stop us doing stupid things. Um, but it could be just a culture of uh, complacency, risk aversion, um, it just became a momentum in a, in a in inertia in a company, but it keeps things kind of frozen in place. What COVID has done, and I think what other shock events to our society have done, is that they have enabled and emboldened change agents, and they have given us um, a reason that we all have to embrace change at a much more rapid rate. I give you examples, you know, in the uh, educational sector, the embracing of distance learning. Now, it's, is it perfect? No, uh, but it's certainly something that has been a bridge to help us to educate kids even when we all had to remain socially distanced. I think you're gonna see that continue to be at least an ingredient in the education system going forward. Should it be the exclusive way we educate kids? No, there's real value in having them together in physical spaces. Can it be a complement that allows kids and students to get access to the very best teachers, even if they're not inside the walls of the, of the physical institution they're attending. Um, yeah, that may be a good compliment. So I think you'll see that we're never gonna go back to January 2020, right? This, this defrosting is going to mean that we'll move into a different space and eventually this will freeze into a new shape. And the question is, what's that shape going to be? I'll give you another example from the medical industry. Um, in 2019, the total number in the United States of telehealth visits, people using their phones to speak to their doctor, was about 50 million visits last year. We are on track, according to Forrester Research, to have almost 1 billion telehealth visits in 2020. Now, that's not appropriate, again, for all doctor visits. So sometimes you need to be there physically. But for many, it's a much better and more efficient way to see your doctor. So I doubt that we will go back to 50 million visits in 2021 or 2022 or whenever this is all behind us. Pre-existing trends in automation and technology have accelerated. This is the point that Rakaya made. A successful recovery strategy must look at new ways, uh, the new ways that we are going to live, learn, and work. There are manifold different impacts here. And so this is the perfect time to be sitting down as a community, thinking not only about what we need to be doing on this uh, reopening period, but also thinking ahead to 20, you know, 2023 to 20 and saying, what is the world is going to look, what is it going to look like? How do we react and how do we put Oregon in the best position to thrive? I will tell you that for somebody who has done now two telehealth visits this year and had never done one before this year, I welcome that change. And I'm sure many of you do as well. So what kind of additional change are we talking about? And really, it's practically everything. I mean, that really includes thinking bigger about industry growth and opportunities. It's about overhauling our education system and our system of social supports. It's increasing broadband access and digital literacy as the world moves to online. It's getting real about racial justice, inclusion, and economic mobility. That's been our work this year and in more than a dozen online sessions, including this summit series. In these events, we've gathered input from experts, stakeholders, and frontline communities. We've had views about the needs and the opportunities of industry sectors and manufacturing the perspective of our BIPOC communities and business leaders, and that's just the groundwork. Today, we wanna to offer a framework, a strategy to consider for Oregon over this decade. Now, this isn't perfect, and we will need your ideas on how to make it better. We weren't able to get 
feedback sessions prior to this session, and we hope to be able to roll those out in 21. And even more, as we meet with you, we will need your help to make this actionable. Later, we'll hear from Governor Brown and get her reactions to the vision as well. And in the months ahead, we'll schedule more meetings like this to hear your perspectives and partner with you on many of the opportunities we identify today. So let's just remember why we do this work and what we value. It's about a better Oregon, healthy, thriving families, engaged and safe communities, a healthy natural environment, a productive economy, effective governance, and prosperity and opportunity for everyone. We recognize and celebrate interconnectedness, a strong economy, quality of life, and public services mutually reinforce one another. Environmental quality and economic growth go hand in hand. Diversity, equity, and inclusion will make us stronger. Communities have different needs, assets, and opportunities. Strategies should reflect those communities and differences of which we see around our state every day. So let's turn to the framework as we envision for navigating this decade. We begin with our fundamental goal, building a prosperous recovery in this decade and sharing it more widely. Shared prosperity is key in this goal. It's about making the American dream come alive regardless of where you were born, your family's wealth, or the color of your skin. It's about creating opportunities in all regions and all communities of our state. To meet this goal, we're adding to our traditional business plan measures of progress, which normally include job growth, per, per capita income improvement, and poverty re reduction. We also want to close the income and employment gap among different racial groups, encourage greater wealth creation that's shared more broadly amongst Oregonians. We wanna boost economic mobility to ensure that children growing up in lower income communities aren't locked into intergenerational poverty. We will measure our progress towards this goal as we move through the decade ahead. So every good strategy has imperatives. And we envision three complementary overlapping imperatives for achieving shared prosperity over the balance of this decade. We need to one, grow, create, and attract good jobs. Two, prepare Oregonians for those jobs of today and tomorrow. And three, provide supports that enhance access to Oregonians to opportunity and economic mobility. Those imperatives we believe hold together our vision. The vision is shaped by an essential idea that economic growth is necessary, but insufficient by itself to arrive at a more widely shared prosperity. Now let's talk a, a little bit more about each of these. Let's dive into imperative number one, to grow and restore the economy. When times are good, we tend to take a healthy economy for granted. When the economy stumbles as it has this year, we're reminded why business growth matters so much. Unemployment creates enormous stresses. Businesses failure ruins dreams and livelihoods. Income tax receipts drop, harming vital public services. So how are we doing? Well, last year at this time, as John Taponia reminds us, we were riding a long wave of economic growth. Let's take stock. The expansion checklist, 37,000 jobs per year, incomes growing faster than the US average, third best state recovery, uh, revenue recovery in the country, and poverty declining. And we were doing pretty good. But by April with the pandemic, much of that economy had shut down and employment plunged. You might recall at the December summit, we talked about uh, the Oregon business plan success in creating uh, and, and exceeding the goal of 25,000 jobs a year. In fact, we had created 37,000 jobs a year over the course uh, of the last decade. And as you can see here um, in March and April, uh, gave uh, 250,000 plus of those jobs back, essentially 10 years worth of that goal back in the course of a little bit more than a month. And so in essence, what we did very quickly has moved all the way back to mid-2013 in terms of the number of jobs. It's really um, jaw-dropping to look at. Uh Almost 10 years back in one month, as John said. 
just shows you how risky we can, we can be if we're not careful. Today, we're back up a bit, but far from a real recovery. Hospitality and retail, well, they're reeling. Federal PPP cushioned the immediate impact of the shutdown, but those resources are running out. Minority-owned businesses often face even greater stress. And you see on this chart, uh, down 22% in Oregon, and the nation's down just a little bit under 21. There's an immediate need to continue focusing on stabilizing as many firms as possible and doing many of the things OBI President Sandy McDonough mentioned back in July. So I hear things like liability issues, a concern about being sued. We need to address that. We need to minimize new costs like new taxes and new regulations on employers. They're going to make it harder for them to um, bring people back. And then just real common sense things like do they have access to personal protective equipment. We're hearing many employers still are having a hard time from that. And Sherry mentioned childcare. I mean, I hear that from employers all the time that their workers are very concerned about the ability to come back to work if they can't take care of their kids. And when we think about long-term job creation, the Oregon Business Plan focuses on traded sector industries. These are essential to every successful economy. Traded sector businesses create products or services to sell outside of their regions. Dollars from these sales circulate through the local economy, sustaining businesses and public services. Traded sector industries tend to cluster in certain places that have a particular advantage. These include raw materials, people with know-how, specialized suppliers, educational institutions, and so forth. And regions differ according to these advantages. As we think about a successful long-term strategy, Kristen Kettles from the Harvard Business School advised us to think about what makes Oregon's economy uniquely strong and distinctive, and then build upon that. Think not only about your weaknesses that you need to address, which we often do, you know, what, what are the weaknesses or the, the things in the business environment that are, are bothering you as a company, but think also about your advantages, about your strength, about your capabilities, because that's ultimately going to lead to the success of your location. It's not enough just to address your weaknesses. Companies always think in their strategy like that. What is our unique advantage? Locations seldom do. And as we've looked at this, we see Oregon as a grower, maker, and creator state that benefits from some tremendous advantages. Some things we have. We have unique natural resources in agriculture, forestry, and less well-known seafood. In ag, we have more than 300 kinds of crops that literally is the thread that weaves our state together. Manufacturing is a core economic identity, from cheese to wood products to computer chips to advanced airplane parts. We have global leadership in footwear and sports apparel industries with some of the most innovative outdoor gear makers in the country and the world. We have natural beauty and outdoor recreation that draw visitors to our hospitality industry and attract talented individuals to drive our high-tech enterprises. We have an advantageous location on the Pacific Rim to market products and services that we create. To compete in this decade, pressing the advantages calls for preparing for the future of manufacturing, which we'll hear about here in a few minutes, encouraging more entrepreneurship and innovation across our suite of industries, Maintaining Oregon's natural resource advantage, which again, we'll hear about here in a little, in a while. Maintaining Oregon's appeal to talented workers and building an overall business climate that aligns with values and encourages job creation. And connecting with industry leaders with state and regional resources, such as university research, internships and apprenticeships to make our industries more competitive. And that's just imperative number one. So now let's talk about imperative number two, preparing Oregonians for jobs of today and tomorrow. Oregon's long-term economic well-being depends on higher shares of its youth and adults completing some level of post-secondary training. Technological progress and automation have eliminated many forms of routine work. And at the same time, the workplace requires greater knowledge and skills in analysis, problem solving, teamwork, and communication. The pandemic has exposed and accelerated inequities 
that keep many Oregonians from accessing education opportunities that lead to good jobs. Many Oregonians in low-wage, low-skilled occupations have lost jobs in industries hit hard by the pandemic, and they need a new pathway to employment. Oregon can do better at this by reimagining its education services at all age levels. With stronger support for learners, innovative models, and more equitable access, Toya Fick made this case at one of our earlier events. Well, I mean, we've been talking for a long time, uh, as long as I've been in education and well before about the need to rethink how we do education to shake things up quite a bit. And now is that time from the calendar that has been created and used for hundreds of years, which never made sense to people, um, to what time school starts for high schoolers. I think it is really time that we start to think about what hasn't worked, how we fund it differently and uh, be creative about what, what needs to happen in the future for our kids. And so I'm looking forward to working with, you know, teachers unions and our superintendents and all the folks involved in the system to really sort of put, put down what, we've, what we know about education in terms of how it's, how it's been going and how, it, how it's happened over the last hundred years and really reimagine and rethink what the future can hold for, for our K-12 system. And it will take all of us to do that together. So I'm looking forward to that. You know, to build off of Toya's comments, I was listening to a podcast uh, recently that talked about the speed and the rate of change that's coming ahead of us for the next decade and, and really have, was, was blown away by the comment of, of an irrelevant workforce. And I think that, um, you know, our education system and our leaders and our business community need to be very mindful of making sure that, that we're getting ahead of that um, versus trying to play catch up, uh, which we could be facing in the next couple of years. So we have got to build a more equitable, student-centered P20 education system. We need to expand access to adult workforce training, especially for displaced or historically underserved workers, and build a stronger support system to sustain a talented workforce for the future. So now let's look at imperative number three. The third imperative is just as important as the other two. And too many Oregonians have been left behind over the years, especially those from communities of color and our rural communities. The pandemic, economic crisis, and social unrest in our communities have not only heightened the need to restore economic vitality, but also to make sure that economic equity and mobility are accessible to all Oregonians. This calls for a new targeted investment in communities and for institutional reform reforms that support economic and social equity, inclusion, and mobility. Specifically over the long term, we need to, one, ensure affordable, accessible housing and health care for all, reform our safety net system to foster agency and upward mobility, improve access to high quality childcare and early learning, reform our safety and criminal justice system to build a stronger, safer, and more just communities, and as we do so, we need to build with clear and intentional priorities in order to dismantle systemic racism. I, I, I do. I mean, my, my thought is to always understand what problem you're trying to solve. And, and not a suite of problems, but what is the primary problem you're trying to solve? And are you willing to lead with that? not to have it included as part of a portfolio of impacts, not to have it be a downstream lever. I mean, but what problem are you trying to solve? And are people in the room for the same reason? And, and, and it's always a challenge when you begin to say, how many people can I bring to this? If a part of that, if the collateral damage from that is a lack of specificity and focus as to why you're in the room. That comment about being anti-racist is, is very powerful for me. It's not enough to simply not be racist. It's where do you line up on a field that has two polarities? You're supporting or you're opposing, and you're doing it in a very dramatic and intentional way, understanding that for many people of color, once they leave the building, once they leave the workforce, once they leave their place of employment, they go back into lives where the impacts of racism and white supremacy 
are as ubiquitous as the air they breathe. You know, it's got to be who lines up with you around that issue so that it's clear that silence is not to be misinterpreted as a lack of prioritization. I want to thank Michael Alexander for his comments there. And, and, and if you get a chance and you didn't see it, uh, there's about a 20 minute uh, stretch in an, in an earlier um, series event that we hosted where Michael gave some amazing comments um, we're, we're, you know, really around racial justice and everything that's happening around us and would encourage you to, to, to go uh, watch that if you haven't seen that already. So that's the framework for the strategy we have in mind. Now it makes sense to ask, so where do we go from here and how do we get there, both short and long term? The immediate need, of course, is to fight the pandemic. And we got hopeful news yesterday with the, with the dispersion of, of um, immunization, and, and, and hopefully that puts us on the right path to recovery in 2021. It also means assisting individuals that have lost work and supporting struggling businesses that we hope will come back when this is over. Another near-term need with long-term implications is broadband access. Broadband is an essential place, piece of infrastructure, critical for education, telehealth, social connections, shopping, and so much more. If we accelerate broadband usage to address immediate needs, we will also strengthen our state competitively for the long run. More communities will be attractive to teleworkers and we will be more productive. The digital divide for low-income Oregonians and people of color will also shrink. And as this quote says, as we move into the future, broadband will be as vital to social and economic advancement as highways, bridges, and dams were in earlier eras. Think about that. Government schools and businesses have already stepped up to the challenge. The governor and legislature have allocated dollars to increase access for school-aged children. Providers like Comcast offer discounted rates for low-income families. Businesses and community partners have come together to distribute computers to families in need. So let's keep pushing to make broadband access a priority. Beyond these immediate concerns, we have other opportunities to consider. The most promising are in economic development, especially manufacturing, in education and workforce, and in natural resources. These are just the opportunities that jump out at the moment. Undoubtedly, they will change over time. These are all held up by a moment of racial equity. We are looking to partners and other community leaders to give us more ideas as we go forward. So broadly, there are any number of opportunities that we can seize to boost our economy. Pausing new taxes and regulations and supporting pandemic-stricken businesses will be important. We've had an over 41% increase in business taxes in the last three years. We must capitalize on our strength in manufacturing, planning and prioritizing infrastructure projects, supporting the Futures Commission work on entrepreneurship and innovation, creating a forum to explore a stronger economic development system for Oregon, and supporting BIPOC-owned small businesses through mentoring, purchasing, and capital access. Implementing the historic, historic, historic legislation passed to 25,000 new housing units a year to improve housing affordability. And that's just a short list. Time is short, so let's focus just on manufacturing. We'll touch on support for BIPOC-owned businesses in a minute. We learned a lot about it in partnering in virtual sessions with our industry cluster partners. Manufacturing is a huge opportunity it's core to Oregon's economic identity. It's responsible for 15% of the gross state product, 10% of state employment, and pays well above average. We have critical masses of manufacturers here, whether they make cheese, microchips, wood products, or windmills. And as Steve Brown told us, that critical mass creates an opportunity to capitalize in an accelerated interest 
in onshoring supply chains, which could add thousands of accessible, well-paying jobs in our state. There are many companies looking, you know, with the disruption in supply lines that happened as a result of COVID, looking to reshore manufacturing, to bring it back from China in particular. Um, you know, we're competing with all the other 50 states, but let's figure out ways we can at least get a piece of that pie and bring people back here to do advanced manufacturing, to embrace 3D manufacturing, and so on. We are also uniquely positioned to build a lead in technologies that will define Industry 4.0. Again, let's hear from Steve. Um, you can start to rethink the way you deliver manufacturing. So especially as you embrace um, additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing, um, you can get to an era where a small business in Oregon could comp compete on a global scale, or at least a national scale. So this, think about the way that you use Kinko's today, right? If you want to print something at Kinko's, you can upload the file on the web they print it and you go and pick it up or they'll ship it to you. The same thing should be true for manufacturing in the future. So that if you want something, you upload the design file, you, you put the bid out to compete. A great Oregon manufacturer picks that bid up, bids on it, wins the bid, creates that object and ships it where it needs to go. The opportunity for Oregon to, 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 to compete on a global scale should be like it's never been before. Now that's an exciting future. And as Shane Wall, an executive leader at HP has told us, we have a compelling ecosystem of players here that could allow for us to intentionally carve a position of global leadership in creating these technologies. Is Oregon has many of the key components that can make this a reality. HP, we're not the only competitor. We certainly are the largest manufacturer of 3D manufacturing printers, is based here in Oregon. In Corvallis, all of the fundamental science goes on for 3D printing, and just across the river in Vancouver, those products are manufactured for worldwide use. But it's not limited to us. With people like Siemens and Mentor, we have the computer-aided design capabilities that are moving and working towards generative design that actually give tools that allow you to design in a digital way. And with the likes of Big ML and Agility Robotics, we have a set of startups, many of them in the software domain, that take machine learning, a particular implementation of artificial intelligence, and apply it into the manufacturing space for these exact uses. And on the back end, we have very large companies located here that will see tremendous benefits from that manufacturing revolution, a Boeing and a Daimler, or in the consumer domain, a Nike or an Adidas. We have all of the aspects to truly create the future of digital manufacturing, the future of manufacturing here in Oregon. It will take some will, it will take some desire on the part of industry, and it will take support from our local government, but we can pull this together and become the leader in digital manufacturing. Sounds like we have an opportunity to become an accelerator. So what do we need to do to seize these opportunities, particularly with respect to onshoring? Let's hear from two manufacturing leaders in Oregon. Jessica Gomez is the CEO of Rogue Valley Micro Devices, and Lori Oland is president of Miles Fiberglass and Composites. Hi, I'm Jessica Gomez. I'm the founder and CEO of Rogue Valley Micro Devices. We manufacture MEMS devices. We fall under the semiconductor industry. Today, our economy is going through a transformation like we may never see in our lifetime. With a global pandemic and US-China relationships strained, manufacturers have a big opportunity. We now know that Manufacturing is not just about economy of scale, it's also about regional resiliency. And if you remember at the beginning, back in March, we started having some pretty big supply chain issues. We couldn't get materials. There were challenges all over trying to get the, the right equipment to support our medical staff. So we are looking at those things in addition to um, issues of national security, especially when it comes to the semiconductor uh, industry. That presents 
a big opportunity for Oregon, one that we may never get again. The next five years are really going to be critical. We need to be competitive. Um, we're going to be competi competing with states like Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, Texas, for the attention of those companies that are really looking to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. to solve some of these issues that we've been discussing. In order to take advantage of that opportunity, Oregon needs to make some strategic changes. We need to look at our land use planning policy and modernize that. We've also, as a company, had challenges um, in that system. The regulatory system that we have is also overly complicated. We're not saying that we don't want to be regulated. We're saying we need it to be simplified so that it's easy to, easier to comply and less expensive. Workforce is going to be a huge issue. We need to coordinate with our higher ed and community colleges. And if we can do that, we will have a world-class workforce here. I really hope that we are going to take advantage of this opportunity. I know on the semiconductor side, um, there is federal legislation working its way through Congress um, called the CHIPS Act. And if that goes through, there is going to be uh, an important and historic incentive programs for semiconductor manufacturing. And if we can align our incentive programs in Oregon to match those at the federal level, we really can be competitive. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. Oregon is home to many small businesses, promoting innovation, leading to unique, creative products. The number of small businesses and diverse range of products leads to a robust supply chain and a stable economy. When you think of all the diverse industries, agriculture, forestry, food, beverage, apparel, and transportation, just to name a few, there's just about something for everyone. We are one of the few states that does not have a military base, but does have many manufacturers supplying the military. Many of them have produced new innovative products that has also worked their way into the civilian markets. For all these reasons and more, Oregon manufacturers remain stable, innovative, and prosperous. My biggest concern for manufacturers in Oregon is the increasing fees and regulations. Manufacturers try to be agreeable to more taxes for the greater good of education, human services, and roads, etc. But we are in a need of a pause until we can get back on our feet again. Over the past three years, we have seen more new taxes, employment laws, environmental laws than we have seen over the past 10 years. Some of the environmental reports and fees are for the same regulation. I know the purpose is to deter from using the chemical, and trust me, we would if we could, but to date, there is no substitute. Through innovation in our industry, we have reduced emissions 50% while increasing production 50%. However, we make the very products that are good for the environment. We make wind turbine parts, electric buses, and electric car parts, and parts for satellite communications like for SpaceX. I think there's a lack of understanding on what the overall big picture is accomplishing. Oregon should be promoting and the opportunity for manufacturers. There are many land use issues that need to be fixed. We tried to move our facility into one and it took us nine years to find a place. We wanted to build, but there was very little land designated for manufacturing. What little land there was, was located next to neighborhoods or remote areas, not convenient for transportation. If we were to build, one third of the cost would have been for permits and fees, making it unaffordable to build. We finally settled on a building to lease, which was not ideal, but the only choice we had. Oregon has one of the best opportunities when it comes to technical workforce training, and we should be promoting this. With the many community colleges and one of the best manufacturing extension partnerships in the country, we have an advantage to promote even more innovative products that will assist in promoting our economy and our environment. Thank you. So we need a plan that integrates all of these dimensions into a comprehensive roadmap for Oregon to seize the opportunities here. Oregon Business and Industry has agreed to lead that plan. The Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center launched in the past few years through extraordinary leadership of Senator Betsy Johnson is a key resource. We're looking for other partners. Let us know if you would like to get involved. 
in this very important opportunity for our state. So we talked earlier about the need to step up our game on education and workforce training, and we believe education is a key second pillar uh, to the building of this plan. As an overriding theme, let's seize the opportunity to reimagine our education system at all levels with stronger support for learners, with innovative funding models and more equitable access and outcomes. More specifically, let's advance the equitable engagement in STEM and CTE to help learners explore their interests, develop their talents, and put them on a pathway to college and careers. In that regard, the Oregon STEM Investment Council has just updated its plan with special emphasis on equity and inclusion. Let's accelerate new workforce development models to meet the needs of adults and improve their pathways to good jobs in a fast-changing economy. As noted earlier, let's close the digital divide in distance learning. Let's expand access to early childhood education and childcare. This will ensure that all children are healthy and prepared to learn. Let's prioritize equity investments in the Student Success Act, which has laid a foundation for equity and strengthen the engagement of communities. And let's strengthen post-secondary access and completion. That leads to higher wages, lower unemployment, more civic and community engagement, and greater economic mobility. We must prioritize need-based aid to ensure equitable access and completion of post-secondary apprenticeships, certificates, and degrees. Clearly, there's a lot to do here. Today, let's go deeper on just one example. Let's talk about adult workforce retraining. The pandemic has disproportionately impacted low-wage workers who have less education. At an earlier Summit Series event, Ben Cannon highlighted the challenge. Ben is the Executive Director of Higher Education Coordinating Commission. Our commission, along with the Workforce Talent and Development Board, recognize that too many adult Oregonians lack the financial stability that more education and training can provide. And as we've seen um, in this recession, as, as we've seen in prior recessions, uh, one's access to and success in post-secondary education the, in the form of some sort of credential certificate or degree is a strong determinant of one's ability to, uh, to maintain employment um, during uh, difficult economic times for our state, for our country. We likewise understand as we look towards the future, the economy of the future, that increasingly jobs and especially good jobs will require uh, higher levels of education and training. And it is our responsibility as a state and as a system to provide adult Oregonians, not just recent high school graduates, with opportunities to train and retrain to meet the needs of a changing uh, economy. In addition, MIT professor Paul Osterman stressed that major change is required to meet this challenge. What does building a system mean? It means convincing employers to take the system seriously, which is not the case in most other country. It means getting workforce boards to work with these intermediaries to be very serious about identifying quality and working with them and weeding out weak players. It means getting the big players in the system, the community colleges, the board, workforce boards and intermediaries to play nice. So for example, community colleges could refer people to, I mean, intermediaries could refer people to community colleges for training. It means making the system transparent to people. And it means actually bringing the one stops, the employment service in from the cold. Typically when someone like me talks about the job training system or the community college system, they don't talk about the employment service, but you need somebody to help people navigate what I've just described. And that's the role of the one stops. The one stops typically in most parts of the country, I can't talk about Oregon, uh, are way behind the curve in terms of technology. They don't look like effective staffing services. They should look like effective staffing services. So if we hope to avoid an unequal recovery that further widens inequality, we urgently need to reinvent the way we provide adult education and training. The Workforce and Talent Development Board has done just that, creating a team to rethink the delivery of services. Board members Sherry Dunn and Mark Mitsui, who co-chair the effort, will share more about the opportunity to better connect adults, especially those historically underserved, to good jobs. Sherry is the CEO of Prince and Principal of ITBOM Consulting, and Mark Mitsui is president of Portland Community College. Let's hear from them. 
Oh, thank you. The Equitable Prosperity Task Force is part of the uh, Oregon Workforce Talent Development Board. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out ways to uh, invigorate, empower employers, community colleges, and workforce agencies. You know, our goal is that we want to make sure that we are centering those most in need. So it's people of color, low-income people, women who've been hit hard, rural folks in Oregon, so that they have an easy way to access the resources they need for training and to get into the workforce. And what we're looking for in our state is that we're looking for seamless integration of the workforce system entities. You know, wraparound support, childcare has risen to the top, um, enhanced investment and participation of certain industries. We want a system that reflects the communities it serves, basically. A system that also is acknowledging the historical harm that has happened in the state and focuses on pathways to both encourage and help communities of colors move to equitable prosperity. A workforce system that's transparent and accessible to users so that there's you know, no wrong door to enter the system. And we also wanna leverage our data to make decisions better. Um, so, you know, this is what the Equitable Prosperity Task Force is about, and it's been up and running really quick, and we have five imperatives. One is to foster deep and sustained commitment by employers in identifying and communicating the skills they need. Explicitly identify outcomes and solutions to address the persistent lack of employment opportunity for disenfranchised communities. Center the system on the user improve alignment in agencies with nonprofits that provide wraparound support and provide those organizations support that they need and extend the apprenticeship model beyond uh, manufacturing and construction trades. And those are the five imperatives of the Equitable uh, Prosperity uh, Task Force. And uh, Mark, uh, Dr. Masui from PCC is gonna talk to us a little bit more about one of those imperatives. Thank you, Sherry. You know, education and upskilling are going to be central to creating an economic recovery that is equitable. We know that in the last recovery, 99% of all jobs that were generated during the recovery required some post-secondary education and training. Over 80% of the so-called good jobs, these are jobs with wage progression benefits and, um, and other uh, opportunities, uh, did require post-secondary education and training. And so the communities that you mentioned, Sherry, that are most risk of displacement uh, during COVID as well as the recession, need that unfettered access, the holistic wraparound supports and the no wrong door approach to education and training for upward mobility. So the need is large. Uh, 448,000 adults in the state of Oregon make less than 15 an hour, um, and they're over the age of 25, by the way, so these are adult students, have less than a post-secondary credential. They, they have less than an associate's degree. Also, 270,000 plus of those adults have either a high school credential or less. And we know that in the coming recovery, they're gonna need more than that. And so access to post-secondary education and training will be key to an equi equitable recovery. The holistic wraparound supports you talked about earlier are also very important. We know in the community colleges in Oregon, about two thirds of students suffer from food or housing insecurity, sometimes both. We have initiated something called Pathways to Opportunity. This is a project with all 17 community colleges and the State Department of Human Services to integrate public benefits around students so that they have food on the table, books in their backpack, roof over their head, while they pursue their education, they can focus on school, graduate, and experience that upward economic mobility. Again, the need is great, and so we all have to be rowing in the same direction. You know, it all comes down to people and students. And so I think about a student who came to us a few years ago on food stamps, uh, participated in a welding program, earned a credential, went out, started working, and prior to COVID was doing quite well in terms of annual salary. I also think of somebody by the name of Tara Roberts. Tara came to PCC, a single mother with eight children and was wondering if college was the right path, if she could make it. So, uh, but she had the courage to step forward and then pursued her education, graduated from PCC, went on to PSU, graduated from PSU, 
earned her doctorate at OHSU. Dr. Tara Roberts now works at Virginia Garcia. All eight of her children have pursued post-secondary education to actually now teach at PCC. Education is critical to upward mobility and helping more folks access and to be successful and complete their post-secondary education and training will be key. And this no wrong door approach is going to be an important element of creating that unfettered access to upward mobility. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Mark, that story about Dr. Is Roberts um, is amazing because it showcases the stackability. You know, you build on the PCC education, you move that up to the PhD level. And, you know, this is what we're trying to do with equitable prosperity is find ways to support our community so that we can lift them up. And that there is, as we say, again, no wrong way to enter this system that wherever they enter the system, they can get the support they need. And those wraparound supports are a key element of that story. That story also showcases how it's not just about the individual we help. It's about their family, their children's children, their children's children. You know, the trajectory of a family and a community has been changed. And so uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Matsui, for your uh, comments and participation. And uh, I really thank the uh, Oregon Workforce Talent Development Board for this Equitable Prosperity Task Force. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you to Sherry and Mark. And this is really an exciting opportunity. I particularly want to call out the critical role employers must play as we reinvent this system. Let's make this a priority. Continuing education is key to our future. Now let's shift to our third pillar of natural resources. Putting our natural resources to work on behalf of our environment, community, and the economy needs to be central in our thinking. Oregon enjoys a competitive advantage in forest and freshwater resources, perhaps more than any other state in the nation. They have defined and sustained our economy since the very beginning with trees and field crops growing on some of the most fertile ground in North America. Sadly, with the advent of catastrophic wildfires, our forests have become an urgent management challenge. The 2020 wildfire season claimed over 4,000 homes and burned 1.7 million acres. Cost estimates exceed over $600 million, which does not include the cost to the economy, the natural systems, or public health. Droughts have now become part of our summer seasons. They stretch from Oregon's high desert to the watersheds west of the Cascades. Extreme health impacts, particular harm to most vulnerable communities. Communities of color, the old and the young, people with disabilities and chronic health problems, pregnancies, urban and rural alike. These consequences threaten to diminish, even sidetrack Oregon's effort to recover from the pandemic in a more equitable and sustainable manner. You know, and I've seen firsthand in Southern Oregon with the devastation on our communities of, of uh, Phoenix and talent, but not only that, but the secondary impact that it has on the balance of the community. And, and we've learned, all of us have learned this new term called AQI, right? I mean, who knew a few years ago in Oregon, you didn't even really pay attention to air quality index. And now you're watching it on your phones every day to see how bad it is or, or what, the, what the air quality is like outside. And that devastates um, much more than just what's happening around us. It hurts our businesses, it hurts our quality of life, and it hurts the things that we do here in Oregon. In the last two summits, we also heard from Matt Donegan, the chair of the Governor's Council on Wildfire, summarize a comprehensive set of recommendations, which also deserves support. In particular, we think it's well past time to increase the pace and scale of forest thinning to at least 300,000 acres per year. This will create jobs, improve forest health, and mitigate fire risks. We need to come together to address this issue. Our second opportunity relates to our management of water resources. Unlike most Western states, Oregon enjoys a remarkable advantage in water given our rainfall west of the Cascades. The presence of the Columbia River Basin and our unique geology creating deep, stable, and replenishing groundwater. We expect water will be a critical resource. Smart management of this resource could cement Oregon's advantage and be a tremendous asset to our economy and our communities. 
I personally think it's one of our state's key strategic advantages. PGE CEO Maria Pope has been leading a task force of business leaders on this opportunity. Representatives Ken Helms and Mark Owens serve on the House Water Committee. Let's hear their perspective. As Joff and many of our speakers have noted, Oregon is blessed with an abundant natural resources that should not be taken for granted, but that also need to be effectively managed. OBC has been working on water issues for more than 12 years, and each summit for the past decade has included a topic on water. This project began as the brainchild of Dr. Scott Campbell, a retired veterinarian and successful founder of the Banfield Clinic. Over the last year and a half, OBC has engaged Professor Martin Doyle of Duke University and nationally known water experts to help us truly understand what are best practices and what are some cautionary tales. Last year, he addressed all of us at the summit. Most importantly, this is a statewide effort guided by input by more than 75 interviews and follow-up conversations with a diverse group of people across the state, tapping into their expertise, passion, and working knowledge. Today, I'm joined by two of the state's leading water policy experts, Representative Ken Helm, a Democrat from Beaverton and an attorney by training, as well as Representative Mark Owens, a Republican from Kearney and a farmer, both of whom serve on the House Committee on Water, a committee created by Speaker Kotek to reflect the statewide importance of managing our water to benefit our economy, natural resources, communities, and cultures. Thank you both for joining us here today. Chair Helm, can you please help us understand why wa managing our water is so important and critical to our future? Well, thank you, Maria. And thank you to OBC for keeping water as a primary topic for the state um, over the many years that you've been giving it attention. Uh, we're not done yet and it'll be needed in the future as well. You know, we've got in, in Oregon and across the West, we have a, a water system that was created in the 19th century that we now expect to solve 21st century problems. And it's just not up to the job. Uh, one of the problems is as we face uh, a future where climate change is going to decrease snowpack, uh, we're going to have water that comes in the form of precipitation like we always have but it's not going to stick in the form of snow. It's going to run off immediately um, and try to get back to the ocean as fast as it can. This, among other challenges, creates management issues for us that we're really going to need to dig into. And whether that is attending more to the data that we need to manage water better or looking at regional uh, structures to management, we're going to need to turn our attention to those ever more because those are the type of tools that we are going to need over the next hundred years to adequately manage water in Oregon. Chair Helm, thank you. Representative Owens, what are your thoughts and advice and how do you expect us to work together given that uh, you and Chair Helm come from such different walks of life, professions, different political parties, different parts of the state? What advice do you have for us? Well, thank you, Maria. And I would also like to thank OBC for the continued leadership in the water conversation. The last 12 years are gonna be just as important as the next several, so thank you. Um, good public policy is made with good public participation and good bipartisan support. You can't come up with state policy without working together. You need to have a balance of interest moving forward to make sure that we can produce a product that we'd be beneficial for the state of Oregon. I think Representative Helm and I bring good balance to that conversation. We both have a same goal, that we need to manage water better in the state of Oregon. I'd also like to thank Speaker Tina Kotek for having a water committee so we can have these conversations. These are gonna be just as important now and in the future. There's four main areas that I think that we need to focus on as a state in order to set the foundational work to have a good water conversation. One is a regionalization approach. The state of Oregon is very large and geographically diversified. A one size fits all in water management will not work. Secondly, we gotta have good data. You cannot manage what you do not record. We need to understand the consumptive use. We also need to understand what the water budgets are for individual basins so that we're not over allocating 
and we need to be able to predict that in the future so we can have some planning and to make sure that we can provide good quality water for all as a growing population that is going to be more of a concern we also need to look at the permitting process in the state of oregon right now there's some fundamental flaws with that right now you can allocate water in basins that might be over allocated we definitely need to look at the permitting process also thank you maria thank you uh chair helm uh talk to us a little bit about what you expect from the oregon business council great question maria uh, as you know, uh, the governor kicked off a good conversation about 100-year water vision a couple of years ago and took that conversation to the point at, at which we, we know what the work is in front of us, and there's a lot of it. Um, one of the things that we have to balance over the next year, however, is uh, our state's need to address COVID-19, the challenges there around health, the economic downturn, and of course, uh, our historic need to right some of the racial injustice that has occurred in our country. Those issues are a little more urgent right now, no less important than water, but more urgent. And we, what we need is an ongoing conversation, a serious one. And I, and I think OBC can uh, provide a critical role in that work in keeping the conversation going and having uh, an educational series on water that is from a neutral point of view that helps all Oregonians understand the challenges that we're up against. And as we move into years after 2021 and look to our next gubernatorial campaign, we all need to impress upon the candidates for governor how important water is and that is a problem that is not gonna go away and have them appreciate that and make it a central issue of their governorship. Thank you, Chair Helm. Representative Owens, what uh, last words of wisdom and advice do you have for us? Thanks, Maria. Uh, I would just close with uh, water is a public resource managed by the state of work. We need to help the state manage water better I believe we have abundance of water in the majority of the state of Oregon. We just need to have the tools in order to utilize it better. Water should not be a partisan issue. It needs to be bipartisan support. We live in a great state. We have a great water future. We just need to help with that by producing better management of water. Thank you both. And thank you so very much for your leadership across our state. OBC looks forward to continuing the partnership with you and with many others and for fleshing out these issues. Um, as you noted, we need to really focus on water management, permit reform, data management, and ensuring, most importantly, affordable and quality water is available to every Oregonian. And in partnership with you all and your leadership, diverse group, nonpartisan, will be bringing together a wide group across the entire state for a water seminar series coming this next year to further the discussion in hope of a shared understanding and success for all Oregonians. Thank you so much for being here. And most importantly, thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Maria. Thank you to that panel and thank you, Maria, uh, for leading that task for OBC. So when you think about natural resources and in the year ahead, if we can move ahead on the governor's wildfire recommendations and begin to build a foundation for long-term water management, we will be good stewards of our natural resources. That in turn will give us an important leg up in achieving our goal of shared prosperity. So let's move to the foundation of, uh, that we have on our chart called racial equity. And you know, I want to share with you a story as a, as a leader in the state and having led companies in, in Portland and now in Southern Oregon and across our communities. I can tell you that going back to my time on the Greater Portland Inc. board, where there was a lot of discussion around equity and, and equity in leadership, equity in our employment base, um, equity in our communities, that was really the first time, and this is several years ago, that, that it became very clear to me that if Oregon wants to compete on a national and global scale, we, were, we would need to improve our equity lens in order for us to be held 
at that high standard that we should be um, on a global scale. And with that work, I started really kind of thinking about and getting involved and had done some work in school districts in the past and, and started to work on getting, gaining more knowledge um, of, of the equity work that was already happening around our state, which there are several amazing small groups doing amazing work on equity around our state. And if we can help elevate those, um, that's an area that will make our state even better than it is today. And as I think about that, and I've now had the opportunity to join the Racial Justice Committee um, in our state and work on the Equal Opportunity or Economic Opportunity uh, Committee as well, I'm blown away by the amount of work that we have ahead of us, but the possibility that that will create is incredible for our state. The BIPOC business community has suffered disproportionately from this pandemic. An equitable recovery is impossible without strong support for our BIPOC business community. What does this community need to thrive? We've heard a couple of messages loud and clear. We need to address access to capital and technical assistance, and businesses need to support smaller, more diverse businesses. Let's hear from James Allen Parker, the executive director of the Oregon Native American Chamber, and Ernesto Fonseca, CEO of Hacienda CDC. Um, you know, when we kind of look at uh, kind of more pragmatic solutions, um, and, as Ernesto said, capital access. I mean, how do we how do we call into uh, in existence state backed mechanisms to to ensure lending at, at non predatory rates uh, to the underserved, underrepresented, Native, Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, uh, to those who are unbanked or likely banked, often through no fault of their own. Uh, so getting resources to entrepreneurs who we should and will not leave out of any recovery going forward. Um, and then you pair capital access with technical assistance, but technical assistance that's culturally responsive and community focused with providers who understand the difficulties of owning and operating a business on or near reservation, who understand the common challenges so many of us in our urban, urban communities face. Um, and I'd say finally, let's explore the power of Oregon to be its own stimulus in 2021 uh, and forward. How can Oregon dollars stay as local as possible, focusing on small business with intentional and clear mandates for agencies to meet for contracting with native black, indigenous and communities of color? Um, this is our own economic driver and that economic development must be part of community, community build, uh, not thought of as a separate process. What can we do about this whole thing? You know, one of the things that uh, James mentioned is obviously access capital, but coupled with cultural responsive uh, technical assistance, the partnership between the big companies and the small companies, something that I've been talking about consistently, is something that other states already do. So some larger companies, whether it's Nike or whether it's Intel, whatever it is, they are, you know, they should be allocating some resources to purchase from smaller companies and smaller, smaller businesses. With that said, also they should couple these businesses with some level of uh, mentorship that we don't have. Thank you, James and Ernesto. And we applaud the legislature's appropriation of CARES Act dollars to support capital and technical assistance. And as we, the business plan, look forward to working on and championing policy solutions to ensure that BIPOC entrepreneurs and businesses can lead this recovery. The beauty of this challenge, though, is that most meaningful things that can be done don't require government policy. We as businesses have the tools at our disposal to do this. James and Ernesto suggested two actions, and there are many others. And I personally think it's how, we, how businesses choose suppliers, how you hold your partners accountable um, to their racial equity lens, um, not only in how we hire and how we promote and how we evaluate, uh, but also in how we market in consumer product businesses. There's so many opportunities around us that we can make an impact on every day that we all need to agree to move forward on that together. I'd like to challenge us as a business community to come together on this topic. And as chair of the business plan, I'm proud to say that this is something the business plan is going to actively work on in the coming year and something that we would like to report back to you in the months, in year, and honestly, years ahead. So that 
concludes this part of our program. And, you know, for the last, you know, really 70, 75 minutes, we've thrown a lot of information at you. In many cases, a lot of it made sense. In a few cases, maybe only one to three things really matter to you. But what's important is that we hit something for everybody so that you have the ability to take this forward and make an impact. We talked about shared prosperity. We talked about our three key imperatives. And we talked about the pillars of economy, education, and natural resources that provide us a baseline and a foundation to build from through racial equity. So with that now, I'd like to bring on our guests. I'd like to welcome Governor Kate Brown um, to our show. I guess it's our show today. And, um, and welcome Governor Brown to, um, to our very virtual summit. Um, we've been able to take what was really probably a seven hour day and, and move it into basically 90 very productive minutes, Governor Brown. So, um, so thank you for being a part of this productive uh, day and, and, um, and we're, we're thankful for you to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I, I would, of course, you know me well, Joth. I would much rather be in person um, and see everybody, but for right now, I'm gonna send virtual hugs to everyone. Well, I think that goes for two of us. I, I, I can tell you doing this is harder than actually being on stage. I actually, I never thought, but the timing and all that's been great. So anyway, listen, we've seen, and, and so kind of want to talk to you a little bit about your, your, your perspective on our document here. The, the thought around shared prosperity, but I kind of want to start with where we ended, and that's our, our conversation around racial justice. And, and, you know, we've recently seen a statewide outright, outcry for racial justice, probably more so in, in our, and that I can remember in my lifetime as, as uh, being a member of the state. Um, I know your team's been working hard to make a dream reality for Oregonians, and how do our goals and our thoughts line up. So in our vision of shared prosperity and your thinking around racial justice, how do you think about those things coming together? Well, first of all, I have to say thank you. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for your willingness to serve on the Racial Justice Council. It's incredibly important work. Um, this year has certainly been challenging, not only for Oregon, but frankly, for our entire country and probably the entire world. But we in Oregon certainly have had our own challenges around both the pandemic, historic wildfires, and then from my perspective, a long overdue clarion call for racial justice. And this year in particular, we have seen incredible groundbreaking work uh, to center communities made vulnerable by systemic racism and colonialism as we work together in what I hope is an effort to build a safer, stronger, and more equitable Oregon. I want to give a shout out to Duncan Wise uh, for reaching out in the spring uh, to start these intentional conversations about racial justice within the business community. I, I think it's fair to say we've all learned a lot, and at least for me, I've certainly listened a lot. And as a result of those conversations, um, I assembled the Racial Justice Council to inform both my budget and my policy priorities for the remainder of my term as governor. Um, I have about two years left at this point. I know that will get some of your folks excited and hopefully it'll make some of your folks sad. Um, but we believe that our Racial Justice Council is literally the first group of its kind in the country. It's comprised of a diverse group of Oregonians from all over the state. And the goal of the council is to center the voices of Black, Indigenous, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Asian, Pacific Islander, and our tribal communities. And we were able to move through this process without a roadmap or a guidebook, but instead we were literally knit together by the knowledge that together we can accomplish so much more than each one of us working alone. I, I think at least for my predecessors and certainly for me in the past, uh, the budget process was really informed by our state agencies, the leadership there, our policy advisors, and stakeholders who had access uh, to my team. Um, I think that's been true for my administration, and I think it's certainly been true for my predecessors. 
This year, the Racial Justice Council was able to mobilize data, passion, and lived experiences to form a cohesive set of recommendations that informed my recommended budget and I hope will help shape the future of our state. Um, and at the request of the RJC, we've made over $280 million in investments in racial justice, which I'm, I'm happy to speak more about later. But I, I wanna sort of weave that work uh, with the work of the Oregon Business Plan's vision for shared prosperity. Um, the tenants that you've already mentioned today are literally reflected in my budget and my policy priorities for the next biennium. And as I said, really reflect the work of the Racial Justice Council as well. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, we're investing $30 million in diversifying our healthcare workforce uh, to better serve our communities of color and our uh, tribes and our immigrant and refugee communities statewide. Um, I, I think there's absolutely no question uh, that the pandemic has made it very clear that we need to make sure that particularly our health healthcare workforce, but frankly, that our workforce um, reflects the communities we are serving. And certainly by diversifying our healthcare workforce, we can begin to reduce health disparities. Um, the investment also includes um, identifying better pathways for diverse providers to work in healthcare, funding scholarships, tuition reimbursement, and enhanced reimbursement rates for culturally specific services, funding training for providers, and establishing, and this is critically important, culturally responsive internships and clinical placements. Um, we are also committed uh, to focus on creating um, the work, as I call it, a seamless system of education from cradle to career. We've got targeted investments in education um, to start. And, and I know this is something your members feel strongly about. We have to recognize that the first years of a child's life are absolutely critical to lifelong success. And that's why my budget expands high quality early care and education programs for 8,000 children through Oregon Pre-K, Early Head Start, and the Early Childhood Equity Fund. But we also funded the Student Success Act, as well as grants to schools under the high school graduation and college and career readiness, readiness fund. I included expansion of early learning and account investments for our youngest children and families and I continued equity investments in the statewide education initiatives account to ensure that our students have the supports they need to graduate from high school um, with the help from educators that certainly share and understand their lived experiences. And don't worry for those of you that are um, committed to career and technical education, um, we invested 5.4 million in CTE um, to make sure that uh, students have the supports they need to graduate and that they have the skills they need to compete in the global marketplace. I will just add um, that we fully funded uh, Ballot Measure 98 as well, the career and technical measure that is so key to making sure that our students graduate from high school um, with the tools they need uh, to compete in a global marketplace. So I'm gonna take a, a sip of water here and I'm Please gonna turn do. it back to you. Great. Well, I think that I'll give you a little time here. I think that the um, having been involved in the Racial Justice Council uh, myself and, and really on behalf of OBC, I, you know, one of the things that's exciting to me is that we're also going to be creating the Racial Justice Council as part of Oregon's system and uh, recommending that that's something that doesn't just live in a small moment of time of reaction, but it actually creates a council that will hopefully live on and have sustainable change for our future. So. Um, so thank you for leading that and, and thank you for bringing us together. And I, I look forward to continuing to be part of that. All thank right. you. I do as well. So last year, when I took over the business plan from Patrick Kreitzer, he promised me that the tax conversation was behind us. All right. So and I should just know that it's government and it's taxes and it's never really behind us. So, you know, I think that, that you know, the business community has been asking for a pause on state taxes and regulations on businesses so they can get back on their feet. Obviously, it's been a rough year. 
And, you know, there's no reason to believe that next year isn't going to be phenomenally better. Hopefully it's a little bit better. Um, but how do you think about that? And how do you how how do you think about helping us achieve that goal? So that's a really good question. And you certainly took uh, this helm at a really challenging time, uh, not only for Oregon, but the entire country. Uh, I continue to hear from businesses across the state, frankly, from every community about the struggle they are facing to keep their doors open during these difficult times. Um, frankly, any business owner who plays by the rules shouldn't face penalties and fees because COVID-19 has robbed them of their livelihood. So I think you know, Josh, that in March, the Department of Revenue implemented measures to help all taxpayers navigate COVID-19. And today I'm announcing, or I announced earlier today, an expansion of that relief to help our business owners who are struggling. The new tax provisions apply to personal income, corporate excise, and corporate income taxes for businesses impacted by COVID-19. Uh, like, for example, number one, 100% penalty waivers on 2019 income tax due. Number two, 100% interest waivers on 2019 income tax due from small businesses that have less than $5 million in gross receipts. And number three, we will continue to provide extended payment plans of up to 36 months for any taxpayer impacted by COVID-19 when entering into an approved payment plan. We both know, everyone in this Zoom room knows that our Main Street businesses are truly the backbone of our economy. And that is why over the course of the pandemic, with the help of my friends in the legislature, we've been able to invest over $260 million in our businesses, including broadband, stabilization funds, and direct relief. Um, obviously, I'm hoping that these tax relief measures will provide another layer of support for our small businesses suffering from the economic impacts of COVID-19. Um, I think you know that many states closed down their construction and manufacturing sectors. I didn't because I knew that these sectors could operate safely. And I, I think we all know now that the economic impacts of the pandemic are fickle much like wildfire in terms of who they affect and how much. So I think flexibility is really key. We know that we have businesses with the ability to pay, but we also have a lot of businesses who don't. We're just gonna have to figure out how to even the playing field. I will just say my budget used a mixture in terms of balancing. Uh, it, it included uh, closing some tax loopholes. It included, um, frankly, taking from Oregon's uh, stability accounts. And the third, it included cuts. Um, as you know, the, uh, the governor proposes and the legislature disposes. So that will be a conversation that the legislature will have. And I fully expect the business community to uh, participate fully in that conversation. But you also folks need to know this, that I'm gonna continue to fight for a federal relief package I recently had the opportunity last week to talk to the U.S. Senate Democrats. Um, I, I just want to encourage every single business owner in this Zoom room to reach out not only to our delegation, but specifically to Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Speaker Pelosi. Um, they need to hear from you that this is critically important, and it is. And frankly, our uh, congressional uh, teams in Washington, D.C. should put aside their political differences and reach a deal. Our businesses are hurting. We need action. We need it now. Well said, and, and thank you for uh, announcing uh, that relief. And I think that all of us that run businesses understand the vital importance of small businesses as an employer, as a supporter of other businesses, and likewise, so on and so forth. And I also agree. I, I think that, you know, a good private-public partnership uh, works both ways, right? So we all got to help each other out to, to, to really grow. So uh, thank you for that. So in the time we have left, I just thought maybe we'd hit on a few other topics, if you don't mind. Um, so when we think about, let's not talk pandemic for a second. 
All right, let's just, let's just, let's maybe move beyond that. We spent a lot of time over the last six months thinking beyond pandemic and kind of what our world might look like. And so we've identified several opportunities. And again, to kind of think about shared prosperity over the decade ahead and really decades ahead, because I think that's our responsibility for our children. So a couple of things, and you've been very involved and very vocal about them. And so I think the first one I want to hit on, and it was a headline earlier today, is just about broadband and the importance of this virtual workforce, economy, school, name it, of uh, just the importance of what broadband, and we had a quote up earlier that said broadband may be as important as the buildings of highways, roads, and dams in previous generations. So what's your comment on that, and, and, and what do you think about that? So um, the, the, certainly the pandemic, uh, not that I was going to mention, you wanted to keep off that topic, That's okay. but it's That's certainly- That's okay. It's, um, it's elevated it. I get it. Yeah. Rip the Band-Aid off the disparities that we see in Oregon and across the country. And one of the places is in broadband and internet access. When the internet first came into being uh, years ago, um, it was my thinking that this would be uh, the tool that bridged the urban rural divide. Unfortunately, because many of our rural communities did not have access, it's actually exacerbated it. And the pandemic has really highlighted it. We know it's going to take roughly a billion and a half dollars and at least five years um, to get Oregon fully connected. And so I can't be here for all of that but I'm absolutely committed to getting Oregon as connected as we can in the next two years. I've invested over a hundred million dollars in broadband in my budget, and we've already leveraged over $20 million in federal relief dollars um, to assist with broadband access. I wanna make sure that we have every single school connected, and frankly, all of the communities that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic connected. Um, I'm going to need your help, uh, you and the entire business community, to make sure that we have the public-private partnerships in place um, to ensure that we have significant access for more Oregonians over the next two-year period. Our needs are absolutely significant, um, and there have been some silver linings, telehealth being one of them. Um, being able to provide behavioral health and therapy needs over the internet. Um, schools obviously have been really relying on comprehensive distance learning. We have to figure out a way to do this faster. Um, we have to deploy all the resources we have on this and obviously explore the use of public-private partnerships for incenting and uh, creating uh, broadband infrastructure throughout the state. I'm hoping we're going to get a little help from the feds as well. That'd be great. That'd be great. There's so many solutions in place, especially in our rural communities and our, in our disadvantaged communities. So uh, thank you for that. And, and I'll promise on behalf of OBC that we'll stay engaged on that. All right. Topic number two, let's talk about adult workforce. We've been, we've spent quite a bit of time here in this session talking about education and really you know, I brought up a podcast where I'd heard about a, an irrelevant workforce if we don't pick up the needs of adult education and kind of moving forward. So as you think about an adult workforce and, and, and the changing of, uh, of skill sets, um, how do you think about some of that work that you've had and kind of how do you look at the next couple of years ahead? Well, as I said earlier, my goal here is to create a seamless system uh, from literally cradle to career. And we don't have that seamless system yet. Um, we're, we're doing better on the early childhood education part and connecting that to K through 12, where I think we've struggled, frankly, as a state and probably as a country, is in the uh, connecting the K through 12 uh, to both uh, higher ed, our universities and community colleges, and our technical education. So we need to continue that conversation. Um, I think it's critically important, um, the seamless nature of it, frankly, um, given that the needs of the workforce are changing so rapidly. I will say where I, I think we really fell short in my budget um, is on the resources for our higher education system. Um, I know that at the national level, um, 
uh, during the last recession, the United States really shifted away from public higher education, literally moving the cost to students and their families. And uh, I am hopeful that this will be a uh, topic uh, for the Biden administration going forward. But I, I do think we need a conversation at the state level about how we fund our higher education institutions and how to ensure that our workers have the training they need uh, to adapt to a post-COVID economy. Um, as you might recall, uh, last session when we were working on the Student Success Act, I worked um, extremely hard um, to include higher education in the SSA, and that effort was not successful. But I do think we must have the conversation about how we ensure that our historically underserved students have access uh, to post high school, whether it's technical, uh, whether it's community colleges, uh, whether it's universities. And the pandemic has really disrupted the marketplace and we, in ways we've never imagined. And as we transform our workforce development, we need to make sure that the workforce training meets the needs of our business community and that business leaders are absolutely at the table during these conversations. So um, it's a challenging topic, uh, lots of funding streams, lots of folks working on it. I wanna make sure that it's seamless and I wanna make sure that we're connecting all the dots. Absolutely agree, thank you for that. And let's move to, to two more topics here while we have the time. So all I really have to say is one word and that's forest. Mm -hmm. And and have the word forest trigger so many emotions now around our state. And it's very different from even the emotions we felt six months ago and kind of the newfound emotions that we felt um, in September. And you and I have both walked uh, the communities in, in Southern Oregon and seen the devastation and Detroit and the devastation there. And, and so we think about wildfire and forest relief and forest management and like, how do you, how do you bring all that together um, as we lead our way, hopefully out of this situation that's been created? And how do we think about that? That's a really great question. Uh, it's something I've been thinking about for years. And I, I do want to give a shout out to Matt Donegan for um, chairing the work of the Wildfire Council, which I initiated over a year ago. Um, the council report, which is several pages long, came up with over 30 recommendations. And unfortunately, um, they weren't enacted upon uh, last year. Um, my hope is that we will continue these conversations. I, I do think um, this is a conversation that we have to have. It's, um, mo it, it's comprehensive. And frankly, it's, um, it's, we have to have a holistic approach um, to what is happening. Um, on frankly, all across Oregon. And so I, I, I think of it in a, in a couple of tranches, obviously um, preparation um, for the next fire season, um, which includes frankly, um, investing in boots on the ground, uh, thinning and harvest, and uh, frankly, um, making sure that we do some prescriptive burning so we can create healthier, more resilient landscapes. I think of it in terms of making sure that our communities have the resources and tools uh, that they need um, to be prepared, whether it's for uh, an emergency evacuation or in case their community is inundated with smoke. Um, and it, it, it is making sure, frankly, um, that we are adapting our firefighting needs to the changing types of fires that we've had. Literally in the last handful of years that I've been governor, we've had devastating wildfires, very, very different um, from Chetco Bar to the Eagle Creek, um, to the um, Canyon Creek in Grant County, um, to this year's um, historically devastating wildfires. So we're gonna have to adapt how we fight these fires. And it's frankly gonna require both from my perspective, more structural firefighting resources and people, but also, frankly, more wildland firefighters. And I think there's some creative things that we can do. 
We also absolutely must help these communities um, that have been destroyed uh, by this year's wildfire. They need to have the tools um, to frankly rebuild, recover, and heal. And my heart goes out to the so many families that were impacted by this year's wildfires. We know that over 4,000 families lost their homes. We've been able, with the help of a really strong partnership with FEMA and uh, folks uh, on the ground, our counties, frankly, and our local communities, we've been able to already rehouse 19 families in Jackson County. But as you know from the numbers, we have a very long way to go. And my budget does include over roughly a half a billion dollars for wildfires, including the work I mentioned earlier, preparedness, prevention, and suppression, uh, with a couple hundred million dollars to rebuild our communities impacted by the fires. I think what's important is that it doesn't make sense to just uh, rebuild, I, I think we have to build them back better. For example, in the San Yam Canyon, instead of replacing septic tanks, you know, they need uh, infrastructure um, that meets the needs of today. And so I look forward to working with Senator Gerard and other folks that live or lived uh, in the canyon and making sure they have those tools and resources. Same is true in the Mackenzie River um, Basin. So. I think it's so important um, that these communities have what they need um, to be stronger and safer in the future. Um, I also think it's incredibly important that we invest in uh, healthy landscapes to help limit the wildfires in the future. Um, I believe that timber is an iconic Oregon industry and now is time, it's the time, frankly, to work together to build the industry from the ground up. So uh, with the help of some public-private partnerships to creatively problem solve, uh, for example, mill logs for affordable housing, um, I'm hoping we can do this better and um, do it collectively and collaboratively. Thank you, Governor, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and there are so many other topics I'd like to get into you into with you, um, uh, but unfortunately, I, I am out of your time. Uh, so, um, so thank you for sharing your day with us. Thank you for sharing your perspective, um, for your leadership during this very challenging year that was 2020. And and um, you know, let's look ahead to 2021 and 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 see if we can't lead our way out of this and create a better Oregon. So, thank you for your time. Thank you, Joth. Thank you so much for your leadership as well. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. What a challenging time to be a leader uh, in our state. I mean, whether you were a, a president or a CEO or whether you were uh, in a state office or governor of a state, um, you know, none of us had, had been through such an unprecedented time um, with a chance to really reflect on the future of where we're headed. And, and really, it's no better time to be thinking differently. It's no better time to be changing. And, and uh, crisis is a great opportunity to change. And, and, um, and, and it's just been an, an awesome year to get everybody's perspective related to where we go from here. So, um, but I really want to turn it over to, to, to three of uh, uh, important people that have, that have played a big role in, in helping shape some thinking um, in the last, uh, really in the last six months. So let's hear from Christian Kettles at Harvard Business School, Patrick Kreitzer, the president and CEO of Tillamook County Creamery Association, and Rakai Adams, chief investment officer of Meyer Memorial Trust. There is often not that much disagreement on what needs to be done to make a state like Oregon more competitive. So why is it not happening? It is because the how is actually very difficult. And this is something that economists usually don't focus on, but that groups like the Oregon Business Plan really have to focus on. How do we make sure that we not only identify net what needs to be done, but really getting it done? What are some of the learnings here? You know, I, I'm bullish, uh, as I've said many times publicly, on Oregon's uh, ability to come together in ways that may not be available in, in other regions of the country. Um, and you know, if we if we can align around this idea of um, of you know uh, competitive businesses uh, 
operating in a competitive position while at the same time supporting, uh, you know, supporting shared prosperity and, and quality of life increases and do that in new, 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 even more collaborative ways. I'm excited about how we can, how we can come out of this uh, situation. Is that this is a time of accelerated change. The pace of change is happening so fast and the states that will be most successful will be the ones who can harness that rapid change and zoom out ahead of those that are not coordinated, that don't have vision and don't have the resources that we do. So we have the vision, we have the resources, as Rakaya said. Now it's time for us to sprint forward. I want to thank the staff at OBC for being such a tremendous asset to bringing this together and thank the many members of the Oregon Business Plan Committee um, who have helped inform and put together uh, this event and this strategy. Uh, thank you to everybody. We look forward to being in touch after the new year. Have a happy holiday and a, and a safe and prosperous new year.